everybody, and welcome to this event from the Intellectual Forum here at Jesus College. Uh, welcome back to those of you who've been here before, and for those of you who haven't, it's really good to have you here at Jesus, whether you're here in the room or you're watching us online. Jesus College has an amazing history. Uh, it's been, it was a nunnery in the 12th century, it became a college in 1496, and we have had an amazing set of alumni over the years, from Malthus and Coleridge to Lisa Jardine and Clean Bandit. We have tried to do things, and we have succeeded in doing things, which made a difference around the world. The Intellectual Forum is much newer, and our aim is to get people to think and talk about interesting and important things, and also to showcase some of the amazing work that's being done by our own fellows, staff, and students. And, and we have one of our own fellows talking today. We're going to hear a little bit about the amazing work that's being done. We'll then hear from our speakers, I think we'll... They will explain how we will do some surgery. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get a brain volunteer, and so we're going to use a jelly brain rather than a real one. But there's still just time if you're in the room and you have a brain that you're not using anymore uh, to come up and, and volunteer it. Um, we'll then have, hopefully, lots of time for discussion, questions, and thoughts. So we've looked at lots of issues over the years. We've looked at everything from outer space to ultra-cold, so how we tackle climate change. But one key issue which we have touched on only a bit is healthcare. Cancer is, of course, becoming much more prevalent, much more serious, and is, in some cases, becoming something that you can live with, but in other areas, we are still a long way away from being able to deal with it. There are difficult cancers, the mortality rates for which can be very difficult. That doesn't stop people from trying to keep working on it, but it perhaps takes some new approaches to how we tackle some of these different cancers. Interdisciplinarity has become increasingly key. And so tonight we have a classic interdisciplinary connection. We have chemists, we have um, uh, manufacturing engineering, and we have a surgeon to talk about what we can do to tackle these difficult cancers. Before we hear from our fantastic star team, I think we have lined up a wonderful video to set out the problem initially for us. And then I'll get all four of you to talk about who you are, why you're here, and what we're talking about, and why you got involved. So, can we play the film? Cancer treatments have improved tremendously in the last few decades. Today, more than half of patients survive the disease. However, some specific tumours in the brain, chest and pancreas remain hard to treat. Nine out of ten people with these diagnoses will succumb to the disease. Currently, with these cancer types, chemotherapy drugs struggle to reach the tumour cells. They face biological barriers put up by the tumour or body itself. Our scientists are designing drug delivery systems to overcome these barriers, following three approaches. First, we are developing nanoscale molecular vehicles that deliver drugs exactly where they are needed and nowhere else. These vehicles are adaptable offering high carrying capacity and a controlled release of the drugs. Second, after the tumour is removed, we can inject gels into the cavity surface, gradually releasing the anti-cancer drugs to eliminate any remaining tumorous cells. Combining these gels and molecular vehicles, we open up further opportunities to enhance therapies and control delivery timescales. And third, we are designing microscopic implantable devices that deliver high concentrations of drug directly to tumours in places that are difficult to operate on directly. These techniques allow us to improve the targeted delivery of anti-cancer drugs, overcoming the biological barriers that make these cancers hard to treat. By focusing on drug delivery, we can boost clinical efficacy of existing treatments. Funded by the EPSRC, the Interdisciplinary Research Collaboration in Targeted Delivery for Hard-to-Treat Cancers combines new and existing materials working towards innovative treatments. The unique collaborative approach between clinicians, scientists and engineers will contribute to better cancer survival rates and improve quality of life for cancer patients. The summary of what we're going to do and the challenge that there still is in some of those cancers. I actually did a bit of work in my own academic career uh, that turned out to be relevant to pancreatic cancer. And I still remember going to see um, a, a specialist at Addenbrooke's who talked about it. And he said, 
um, I'm afraid this was rather bleak, uh, at the time, I, I believe the figures are better now, that any patient he saw with pancreatic cancer would be dead from it within six months unless they were hit by a car in the meantime. Um, things have got a bit better, but there's still a long way to go. So let's now hear about how we can do that. We've got this fantastic team here. Um, and I'm going to ask you to each say a bit about your backgrounds, what you bring, because it's rare to see such an interdisciplinary team. So I'm going to start, um, I think, at that end with, with Stephen, then Oren, Liliana, and, and Ronan. So, so Stephen, um, do you want to talk about your role and yeah. how you got involved? So, so I'm Stephen Price. I'm a consultant neurosurgeon at Adam Brooks, where I run the, the neuro-oncology services, the brain tumour services. I'm also the co-director of the uh, CRUK Cancer Institute, Cambridge Institute's uh, neuro-oncology program. And I, my day job is to treat and look after patients who have got malignant brain tumours. And it's a regular thing. You see these patients will come to see us in clinic. We start, we operate on them. We take away as much as we possibly can. We then treat them with what the treatments we have at the moment, which are chemo, some chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And yet the tumour comes back in exactly the site that we've been operating on and exactly the site where my oncology colleagues have been treating with, with, uh, with uh, uh, radiotherapy. And from a clinical point of view, we have seen no improvement in our outcomes for these patients and no new treatments for over 15 years. Uh, and there is nothing on the horizon. We've tried a whole variety of different targeted drugs and new other types of chemotherapy, and we've seen no, no improvements in survival over that time, which is very depressing. So I'm here really to find better ways of treating our patients and finding better ways of delivering drugs uh, that, may have a, that we know will work, but are often so toxic you can't give them in a high enough dose to get enough of it into the brain to treat these tumours. Oren, who, who is, I should say, a fellow here at Jesus College, so we're very proud of everything that Oren does, whether he's running over things or not. So my name is Oren Sherman. I'm a professor of supramolecular and polymer chemistry at the Yusuf Hamid uh, Department of Chemistry and also the director of the Melville Laboratory for Polymer Synthesis. And my interest in um, hard-to-treat cancers, and in particular also in brain cancer, is how to make depots of um, drugs that can be delivered locally to the spots in the brain directly following surgery um, for, for the tumors because obviously not every single cell has been able to be cut out and that's why recurrence um, occurs. And so what our hope is that we can <clears throat> make materials that are allowing uh, drug cocktails or single drugs that are anti-cancer agents to be diffusing out of the depot into the, um, the, the directly adjacent tissue and not much further, so it doesn't necessarily have the same problems that systemic uh, delivery does. And so as Stephen mentioned, there are some extremely toxic drugs, but if you give them systemically, you have a lot of difficulty making sure that they cross the blood-brain barrier and go exactly to the point that you want them to be um, uh, delivered. And so that's what we're working on. And of course, when you make gels, you have to think about the type of gel that's going to be used and also the material properties because you don't want a gel that's going to be completely uh, rigid uh, relative to the soft and squishy brain tissue that it's going to be in close contact with. And so you also need to think about what's going to happen to this delivery depot. Is it going to be removed at a later point? That's not a very... Um, appetizing prospect for, for a, a patient. And so what we've tried to do is develop gels that are made from materials that are native in the body already, um, so they're not going to necessarily be rejected, but also uh, materials that can be broken down over the lifetime that they would be inside the body for a period of several weeks. They can do what they need to, to do in delivering the, the materials directly adjacent to where the surgery takes place and then hopefully lead to better prospects. And we've seen that, of course, in in vitro studies, but we've also seen it in a variety of animal studies that we've uh, conducted. And we're now trying to move this entire process forward into a phase one clinical uh, trial in, in, the, in the near future. So that's where our interests are in terms of polymer chemistry. Moving on, Liliana. Yes, so I'm Liliana Fruk, I'm associate. A professor of bio nano engineering, and I work in chemical engineering and biotechnology. And we work on formulation of the drugs. As Stephen and Oren told you, there are lots of drugs. Some of them are very effective, but they are also not soluble in water, or they don't come really to the cells where they need to go. So what we are trying to do is to design vehicles which are nanoscaled, so they are much smaller than a cell that they need to target. And then we want to envelop the drugs within these vehicles. 
And the beauty of those vehicles is that they can also be decorated with particular molecules. So in that case, you could find the molecules that can help penetrating some of the biological barriers and get into the tumor tissue, for example. Or you can even have some biological species which you can attach on the surface that would target a particular cell. And what we are looking at are two types of vehicles. One is called a metal organic frameworks, which are very porous structures on the nanoscale. So you can pack a lot of drug within the por porosity of this uh, vehicle. And the other type is polymeric vehicle. So it's softer material. And these softer materials are particularly interesting for solid tumors. Because as Oren mentioned, we also need to think about mechanical properties of biological tissue that we are targeting and also adapt materials that we are using for development of these nano vehicles. As you can imagine, there are lots of challenges that one needs to overcome, particularly when you work with chemistry that needs to be adapted uh, to the biology and the complexity of the whole system. And that's why interdisciplinarity is very important. So we learn equally from our colleagues from clinical side as we learn from other chemists which are involved in the project. And also we want to design materials that can be scaled up and manufactured. And here, that's where we also have engineers that work with us that can help us scale in scaling up of those materials. So lots of chemistry, but lots of biology and, and lots of engineering involved as well. So we've gone from surgery to chemistry to chemical engineering. Ronan. Thank you very much. So my name is Ronan Daly. I'm uh, also associate professor. I'm in the Department of Engineering in the Institute for Manufacturing. And as Liliana kindly introduced, that's uh, where I come in with the team uh, with this project. So you saw three dif very different technologies in the video. And my team has a really nice job of working with each or sub team with each of the other sub teams. So we cut across and we work with everybody. So with all of the different technologies and we help identify research questions about the manufacturing. Because what we want to do is make sure these amazing technologies get as quickly as possible to the patient. So we need to think about what are the different barriers along the way and what can we ask now at this early stage of research while everyone's in the lab working together so you don't work on something and then find actually if we just at the end we, we need to tweak it again so we just help identify some of the challenges in scaling up and we help find ways of studying the materials identifying uh, artificial ways of studying them that mimic what's going on in the body and if we do that now then we don't have to wait till later to find out how things behave. So it really is great to be able to work with each of the technology teams and just help them look ahead and see what are the manufacturing questions that are there. And manufacturing is not just the production, it's the, the, the big M manufacturing, which is the design all the way through to production and all the way through to the supply chain and getting it to patients and getting it to clinicians who will need to work with these materials and devices. So we have, you know, the whole way through, and it, it's, we'll come back to this a bit later, it's remarkably rare to find people thinking the whole way through. Um, again, I, I worked for a bit on uh, drug uh, discovery, and it was completely isolated from the problems further down the road. H here's an amazing molecule. Uh, it works really well in, you know, in the test tube. It doesn't work at all when you have a, a patient. Um, so it's really amazing uh, to see this. But can I perhaps just start back with the problem with brains? So, so can you talk to us a bit about more about brains, why they're interesting, why they're challenging? I mean, we saw, we saw a bit of that in the video. So the issue with brains and brain tumours is, unlike other cancers, which will, uh, other fatal cancers that will, will kill you, during the process of, of it growing, it destroys the bits of you that make you an individual. So the things about your personality, your co thinking, your way of interacting with other people. Uh, so it has a really um, a profound effect on, on, on patients and their families and friends, uh, th th this effect. The, the difficulty we have is that 
th there's no part of the brain that is redundant. We can't, unlike, for example, uh, uh, for a tumour in the colon, you can take out a lump of the colon on either side of it and take out um, to get, to look for what's called clearance. So you, so you have no tumour around it. You can't do that with the brain. We, 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 we tread a, a very fine line between um, leaving tumour behind and taking out so much that we actually cause damage to the brain itself and affecting patients' future quality of life. Um, uh, 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 after that. And, that. and this is the difficulty with it. The problem with the tumours, and our model I'll show you in a minute, is very good at this, is that they don't have a regular edge. So you can actually, there have been studies looking at post-mortem brains, and you can find tumour cells all the way through the brain. Although most of it is in the area around the site of where the, the bulk of the tumour is, you can find tumour cells elsewhere as well. Um, but at the moment, we still haven't got to the first stage, which is controlling the disease, the local disease, at the site of where we are, where, where we are operating, where we are treating with radiotherapy. And what's the current gold standard treatment then for, for well, I mean, it, brain, and if you can talk about the other two examples that were given as well. So I think for, for all tumours, the, 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 the uh, uh, ideal thing is if you can, you take out the tumour that's there. Um, so brain, we call it uh, maximal safe resection. In other words, there's that balance between taking out as much as you can without causing any deficits. Um, pancreas is the same. If you can take out a, a pancreatic tumour, great. But most of them are, by the time they present, and same with lung, by the time they present, they are unate, you cannot remove them all. They're, they're impossible to remove. Um, so then the next phases would be a combination of either um, radiotherapy or chemotherapy as well. Um, for some tumours, there is now a big interest in using drugs that block. So we now know how a tumour cell starts as a tumour cell and grows into a, into a, into a, uh, go from a normal cell to a cancer. And there are drugs that can block different parts of that pathway, so called, so -called targeted therapy. Um, and for some tumours, that's had a massive effect on how, uh, you, how you can treat these, um, these tumours. Um, I think these two, three tumours are ones that have really f have struggled with that, largely, I think, because we can't get enough of these particular um, drugs into the, into the tissue. Brain is particularly difficult because we think there's now three pathway, three or four pathways involved. So if you block one, it's a bit like the London, like the London tube, if you, if the, the tube map, if you think about it, you block a station off, you just go your way by a different route. And that's exactly what these tumours do. They, they can find ways of, 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 uh, of, of, of um, uh, developing uh, resistances to whatever treatment we give them. Um, um, uh, the other treatment that's also being used a lot in many cancers and has made a massive difference again is using the body's own immune system to attack these to attack these tumours, and certainly in pancreatic ca cancer, there's a beginning to see a little bit of an improvement, not a lot, but a small improvement in some patients um, because they have uh, they're able to use the you turn your own immune system to attack these these, these tumours. One of the things that brain tumours do uh, is they turn your immune system off in the brain. They actually stop it. They make it look, makes the whole area look silent, so, that, so there is no. It just the body doesn't recognise it as being uh, a, 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 a disease. It just thinks it is part of itself. So it doesn't. The, body, the, the immune system will not attack it, attack yourself. So this is so-called immune therapy, which is, which has uh, really has not worked at all in brain tumours. So I want to come to, to the model we have because a lot of people are excited, but in a moment. But can I just, before that, bring the rest of you in? Because we've heard the sort of medical motivation as to why this is something we'd want to do. But for the th other three of you, how did you get involved in this? Was it a question of, I need to write some sort of purpose on my grant application and this one, you know, will get it funded? Was it a long-standing interest in tackling these problems? What, what got each of you I involved with this project um, in whatever order you'd like? Well, I, <clears throat> I, I could say that I, I got interested in this for a number of reasons. Um, first and foremost, uh, two people that I had engaged with as colleagues um, over my scientific career, and which is which is not so long um, thus far, uh, have have suffered from uh, GBM, and and that's uh, a shock, right? I mean, so this was in their mid to late thirties, which is a very early time for uh, presenting with the disease. And, and it was a shock to me. And, and so that was a, a clear interest of mine and to understand you know, how can some of the things that we're doing in the lab at a very fundamental level be somewhat helpful at a societal level at, at some point in the future. So very, very clear personal motivation. 
But there are also a lot of other motivations uh, that, that kind of just allowed me to cross paths with um, the colleagues in, in the past, um, one of whom is one of our co-PIs on, on this IRC grant, and Colin Watts, who's in, in Birmingham currently. He was here in Cambridge previously. And, and we've been working together for almost 10 years. And so that was uh, you know, a lot of personal motivation coupled with just being in the right time at the right place. And that's one of the things that I think Cambridge is such an amazing place for, is just crossing paths uh, when, when you least expect. Um, and so those are you know, two, two of the reasons that I'm, I'm here today. Mm. Yeah, so similar to, to Oren, I also unfortunately experienced the cases of, of cancer among uh, friends, and this was a lung mesothelioma. And this was one of the motivations uh, to get engaged. But the other one is also this realm of nanotechnology, nanotechnological tools that we have developed within last 30 years. And they were hailed as a very promising tools that are going to resolve many healthcare challenges. They did indeed make a huge difference, for example, in diagnostics of cancer and other diseases. But, and also in, in terms of therapies, we are getting some of the cancers under control because we are formulating drugs in a better way and we are dealing with them. Unfortunately, those three types that we are focusing on are really, uh, from the molecular cancer biology, also extremely interesting. So one of the challenges for every chemist is how can we apply some of the chemical tools, some of the lab-based tools on resolving the, these biological systems. We are working, uh, particularly we started with pancreatic cancer because it's uh, also in a way very clever to avoid or evade our Im own immune system. It basically creates a very dense shield of other cells. So actually the number of cancer cells within the pancreatic tissue, pancreatic tumor is very small. And the rest of the tumor is built by you know, relatively normal cells that are incorporated within that system. And it has interesting mechanical properties. It's very dense. So it's very difficult to penetrate within the tumor. Still, it has the blood vessels to supply the tumor with the blood and other nutrients. So the question from the chemist point of view is how can we design materials that will penetrate that dense shield? And this is, of course, also a synthetic question which needs to be answered, and it's, it's an interesting challenge. And so I teamed up with a colleague from the same department uh, uh, who, who is working on other type of materials, and we work on one type of material, and we thought, let's try to tackle with our joint uh, um, kind of expertise and tools, can we tackle this mechanically very hard cancer to tackle? So this is the motivation as well. And your excitement. I'm hoping somebody will admit to sort of needing the grant application, but... <laughs> oh, I'm going to disappoint you, yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's not, that's definitely not it. So I guess there's two things. The first was uh, very much uh, coming a long time ago from an industrial perspective, coming into academia and staying there with the research bug, seeing how difficult it is to take great ideas, really exciting emerging technologies, and get them to real applications. Mm. There are so many issues along the way. And you can see this with all of the great initiatives around the UK, ARIA recently, and um, the catapults before that. And in every other uh, research-focused nation, they have these initiatives. But it's just really challenging to get exciting research to where it's needed. And I've been looking at how you do that and, and ways to do that. And this is an area in healthcare where I'm particularly keen because that's where you want that transition to happen as quickly as possible. There are other areas that are less time critical, not in healthcare. Uh, in terms then, the, the second reason was uh, why I ended up in, in that particular area is again, having a bit of a background in chemical mm -hmm. engineering and chemistry as well as that interest, I'm able to help um, and, and talk with people and understand and communication. While multidisciplinary work is absolutely wonderful, you need to have some underpinning capability to talk to each other. So as again, in the right place at the right time, as, as Oren put it much more succinctly. 
Mm -hmm. so we have more conversation to have, but we did have, do have a couple of demonstrations. Um, one, the brain. I think we have some images of, of some of the nano in a bit. So let, let's start off with, with, with the brain. Um, Stephen, do you want to yeah. talk us through? I don't think anybody's volunteered their brain yet. So. <laughs> Who wants to be a, to do some surgery? Oops. Any volunteer? Please do come down. So this is a compromise. If you don't offer your brain, you get to offer <laughs> the, you know, to do the surgery. You can become a surgeon instead. If you just want, if you just want to get my colleague over there who was going to sort to sort out some, put this on. So this is actually quite an accurate model of the uh, uh, of the brain and of the uh, brain tumor. It's actually made of jelly, industrial industrial jelly, and we have within this a tumor, and this is going to show uh, the. Uh, difficulties as surgeons we have in trying to remove all of these uh, these, these tumours. Um, and we're going to do it using the proper equipment, which is... <laughs> the, the funny thing is the spoon, there was, used to be a small... The, until, a f until about 10 years ago, there used to be a small spoon in some of our... sterilised in our, in our surgical kits for some operations. Yeah, just, just so you don't get... That's fine if you don't want to. <laughs> and let's put some gloves on just to stop it from. It's, it's uh, causing a mess. That's it. Okay. And what we're going to do is just take just get, take out this tumor and just show how. To show what, what, what it's like when you're removing these tumours. This is extremely similar to what we will do. Um, okay, we don't tend to use these kind of instruments, but the tumour itself is often very soft, and you never get, you don't get it out in one bit. You get out in bits. Please do come around here. So you can see here, the darker colour here is where the tumour is, and if you just want to use it, and just cut over the uh, over that until you get down onto the, until you get down into it. That's it. And you, you can actually cut a bit out of that. You might find a bit of that. Might take the yeah, bit take that bit out so you can get, we can get a good view of that. Okay, so you can see now the tumour in the bottom of this cavity. Right. Yeah. Now try to just see if you can go round it and take it out with a, with that or the, that or the, the 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 spoon. And again, to get to it, you've had to go already go through some 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 tissues, so you're already going to cause some some damage. Now this is going to come out in. One probably one larger bit or smaller bits. There we are. But you can look at that now. If you just leave that a second, you can see. If you just lift that up a little bit up, you just had there. There is still some staining there. There are still tumor cells left behind at the end of the operation. So even though you've taken out what you think is the tumor, actually it's a marshmallow, um, there still is some remaining tumor cells. And this is the difficulty we have. Now, if you try to take that out, what happens is you'll take out uh, some of it. But also you'll take out a lot of normal tissue as well, and not a normal brain. And this is the part you want to avoid so you don't cause damage to the person from that. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for that. <laughs> but you can see from this still here, there is still some residual tumour there in the edges of it. And that's the bit we need to find ways of treating and find ways of, of providing some treatment directly to that cavity if we can. Thank you. Um, how, how, how was that? Do you feel accomplished as a surgeon? I reckon by the time I finish my degree, I'll be ready. <laughs> 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 so, so I, 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 I shouldn't make jokes about that. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's clearly quite a challenge. Um, have, have all of you tried your own surgery? <laughs> but I do have uh, a, a schedule together with some of the research students to go and see uh, some of the surgeries, because I think it's very important as well for them to see what they are working on. So we will probably go to the operating hall when it's allowed again. Um, and, and I mean, the tools that you actually use, are they very different from this? So much of it is, you're, because you're looking at differences, the brain's often a bit softer than the tumour itself uh, uh, in, in, in places. We often use a lot of things like suction to, to take it out. We also have a lot of other tools where it's an aspirator where the tip vibrates very rapidly with a little, and puts a lot of water, uh, irrigates it as well, and it breaks the tissue up to, into, uh, so you can, it's, it's taken up by a sucker. 
Um, but otherwise, it is probes we use to sort of dissect around it. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, this is standard sort of standard sort of techniques we would we would use. Is the tumor a foreign body to the brain, or is it brain cells that have changed in their form? So, so the normal brain cells that have turned become uh, abnormal, and they and they have. Um, uh, grown uncontrollably. So where normally cells would stop growing, these would, are growing un uncontrollably. So clearly just trying to do surgery is going to be very, very challenging, you know, even with slightly improved knives and spoons, um, you know, the occasional aspirator. So we have to turn to other things. Um, Lilian, do you want to talk us through a bit more technically exactly what it is that you're talking about? Um, do you want to stand here or do you want me to show the slides? Yes, I mean, I can stand here okay. as well um, and show you a little bit of the slides, uh, just to, to, to show you how these uh, nano vehicles that we are designing look like. So on your left hand side, you can see the pictures, electron microscopy pictures of these formulated nano vehicles that are carrying the drug. And those are uh, metal organic frameworks, which means that they are made of metals metal nodes, and those metals are connected with organic linkers, with small organic molecules. And usually the metals are chosen in such a way, of course, that they are not toxic to the body. You can make a lot of these metallic organic frameworks. And the beauty of these frameworks is, as you can see, they also have pores. So they are porous from inside. So they can pack small molecules and those drugs uh, that we use in chemotherapy, which are, have been effective, they are small enough to be packed inside. But the, 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 the beauty of metallic organic frameworks is also that they are adaptable. So you can change the size of the pores so you could also accommodate any other types of the drugs that you might have. You can also have uh, the surface of those materials uh, modified. So this is, for example, an example how the drug would get into the, uh, the, the nano vehicle, but then on the surface you can attach molecules using relatively mild chemistries which could then recognize the cancer cells. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges, identifying what are those molecules which are specific only for cancer cells. And, and you know, we just heard that cancer cells are nothing else but our own cells which have gone a little bit wild. So they have mutated, they grow a little bit faster. So they have all molecules that our healthy cells will have, but maybe in a different proportion, maybe they have something that might be a little bit different. So we are relying quite a lot on cancer biologists to find those biomarkers on the surfaces of the cells that we can target. And, and, and uh, we develop the chemistries that can do this. So one of the uh, examples of these materials are shown here. So just to show you how they can be designed in different geometries, in different porosity, they can be packed with small molecular drugs, but they can be also packed with some larger molecules, such as nucleic acids, if you want to do some something that we call gene silencing, where you can silence a particular gene within the cell, and maybe that this will cause the change in the biochemical pathway and the cell will die. So this is the idea that we can make these adaptable vehicles, which we can then quickly adapt to any drug that would be effective for these particular cancers. So this is one type of the vehicle that one of my colleagues is working on, and my group is working on biopolymeric nanocarriers. That means we try to design nanocarriers which are uh, biocompatible. And this one resembles melanin. Melanin is a pigment which is in our skin, so it's a relatively friendly material, so we know that it won't have any kind of uh, um, effects which are unwanted. So we can design these spheres made of melanin-like material and we can pack the drugs within those spheres. And then again on the surface we can attach molecules which will target particular cells. And the beauty of biopolymeric nanocarriers is that you can adjust mechanical properties. So you can make them a little bit softer or a little bit stiffer depending on what kind of tissue you want to 
target. So this is, uh, these are the two types. And here you see one molecule that, of course, is uh, often used for targeting of some of the cancer cells. But unfortunately, for pancreatic cancer, we still don't have such a good biomarkers. So this is still ongoing uh, work to design those. But this is what you see here is an example of antibody. So it's a, it's a protein that can be made specific for some receptors, for example, on the surface of the cancer cells. I do have some, some other slides, but I will show you as we are discussing as well uh, about the nanotools and other examples a little bit later. So th thank you very much for just giving us an idea of what some of these things look like. And um, being a geek, can I say how pleased I am to see the DNA going the right way round? Um, <laughs> DNA twists one way and not the other way, and most representations get it the wrong way round. I don't understand how it's worse than random, um, but, but, but it is. Um, we're going to come to, 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 I think, questions from the public in a bit, but just what surprised you all the most about working with each other, hmm. coming from various different disciplines? Renan, do you want, can I start with you, since you pulled surprised. such a wonderful face? It when... surprised me, yes. Um, absolutely. I don't know if it's surprising. Um, from experience of being traditionally in a multidisciplinary role in research, this one just went so... It was just easy. It was just, we just got together, started talking, and then it just works. So I think it was just such a nice thing that whenever we get in the room together, the ideas flow, we're all just, I think, I don't know, is it because we've got a couple of very clear targets that we're aiming for, I think, uh, or something, but it, what, I, it was just really nice that it just, you get us in a room together and it's just great, you know, we just focus, get the, you know, get, get working. Uh, it just, yeah, so, not always the case. Surprise, so surprisingly, it worked quite well. <laughs> okay? No, no, no. <laughs> I think for, for projects, I better clarify that, because, uh, you know, you get a really big group of people together from lots of different disciplines. You pick the, the right people to get a team together, and as you know, that doesn't mean necessarily that it, it just feels natural. Sometimes you have to force and structure to get to the right place, but this, this group just, just mm. really clicked. And that was uh, minimal to you know, work to get us just doing everything in the right way. Hmm. So I'm sure you'll all say how lovely you all are, but, but what else was surprising about the process? Oren? I, I think we came from very different backgrounds, and, and perhaps um, while I've worked across many different disciplines, um, <clears throat> it's very wide, and, and bringing in uh, clinicians to work with us in terms of both science and engineering is not something that happens every day. And I think we're um, you know, being led by clinical pull uh, quite a bit, uh, but there's also a, a fundamental technological goal that we're trying to address, which is um, a plat set of platforms of drug delivery. And so um, it, it isn't that we just know exactly where we're going to go and, and going towards a clinical march. Uh, we know that there's a problem, and we're really trying to, to use cutting edge um, uh, areas of science and engineering to get there. and. And I, I'm, I must concur with Ronan. I think that the, the personalities involved here, they mesh well. Um, sometimes people mesh well together. Uh, sometimes they don't, and the science goes well together. But um, I, I think in this particular case, it's a really gr good grouping of people, and, and the postdocs involved in the project uh, really are working well together. So that makes it very mm. pleasurable to, to engage. So, I mean, Stephen, medics are often renowned for, for you know, working together and keeping apart from other things. How did you find working with all these non-medics? So I think the challenge was, and someone's touched upon this earlier on, is language. We all speak different languages, and it's trying to find a common thing to explain some of the terms that we take for granted that may not be explained to other people and explains. You have to think about when you, when you explain something, how you explain it and how you get, a, get that across. And I suppose we do have a bit of experience in that because we spend most of our time telling patients what we're planning to do and a bit about a lot of the, a lot of the things we, we want to talk about. But it is that thing of getting over the problems with, with making sure that you all can speak the same language and, and you, you are, understand the same thing that you're, you're, that you're talking about. Eliana. I think uh, uh, the guys already said the, the most about the atmosphere, but from the scientific aspect, I think the most surprising was really to discover from clinicians how inefficient are some of the drug or, or molecular drug-based therapies mm -hmm. are actually when you, when you work with patients. And we have some of those drugs for many years already. They have been approved 
and they are used in clinic and there are protocols which are followed, but survival for some of those cancers didn't uh, uh, improve. So my curiosity, of course, here as well, and what we try to answer within the project is, can we improve that? Can we have new types of formulations? And how can we be a little bit cleverer, cleverer in using some of the technologies that we have developed in the last 30, 40 years and put them to the use uh, in, in clinic? And I think there are some obstacles. There are some regulatory obstacles as well. It takes a long time to bring a new technology to the patients, and that's why we, we talk to Ronan, and he explores that space as well. But there are also, there is a huge need to, for these interdisciplinary projects. And we talk about the interdisciplinarity so often, but actually we need even more of this interdisciplinarity project, simply because we really need new strategies and new therapies which will be approved and, and taken by uh, clinicians and the patients. So I would say this was a big surprise. Although, you know, we read papers, we talk to our colleagues, we are aware, but actually when you talk to clinicians, you realize how little effect is there of some of the therapies. Very interesting. And of course, there's also a time scale issue that, uh, um, you know, obviously we don't know five year survival rates of any treatment for quite a long time after it's been invented because you, you know, have to wait at least five years uh, plus the rest. So um, I have lots more questions, but I, I should probably let, let other people do them. So are there any, if there are any questions in the room, please do just put your hand up um, and one of the team will run around with a microphone. Um, and we, we can also get questions up to those of you who are up in the balcony. If there's stunned silence, I'm going to assume you want me to ask lots of questions. But right, we've got our first one over there, and then we've got one at the front here. Um, as someone who is a complete novice on this, this is maybe a very basic question, but I'm totally intrigued in the idea of trying to get drugs inside something that is so tiny. <laughs> How does one possibly start to go about doing that? The drugs are even tinier. <laughs> so, so, this is, uh, um, so we are talking here about molecular drugs, which would be usually in sub-nanometer scale. So nanometer is a very small part of, of, of the meter. So if you think about a cancer cell, it would be on the scale of 10,000 and more nanometers. And if you th think about the molecular drugs, there will be less than one nanometer or a little bit bigger depends. And those nanoparticles are somewhere around 100 nanometers. That means that they can still cross some of the pores within our blood vessels. They can diffuse through some of the tissues, but they are much smaller than the cells. So you can pack tiny things into a little bit bigger things <laughs> that are still tiny. So this would, this would be my answer. Okay, we have a, a question at the front there, and then we'll have a question from online, probably at the front online, but you don't have to be at the front to ask a question. Yes, you're a team of four with very distinct different disciplines behind you. Can you really have one single common goal for the project as a whole, or is it one of you leading with your goal and the other three sort of padding it in and bringing their discipline to it? many more of us than, than just the four that are here this evening. Um, there, there are people uh, across um, in engineering, there are plenty of other clinicians that represent not just the, the brain cancer side of things, but also pancreatic cancer and mesothelioma. Um, and then we have people within the formulation sciences, uh, and that team is spread about in terms of the other academics at Imperial College in London, uh, at UCL, at, at Birmingham, in Glasgow, mm -hmm. in Nottingham, uh, different types of partnerships with, with other colleagues in, in Liverpool. So there's, there's, there's a wide range of, of, of PIs and interests. And you're right, the, the common goal is to be able to fundamentally understand about platforms for delivery, new technologies for delivery, and, and at the same time be pulled into the clinical um, 
areas that we've identified, these three very hard to treat cancers. And so, you know, there's, there's groups of us that are working more closely aligned at different parts of the project mm -hmm. with some of the clinicians, more, let's say, in the brain cancer area or within the pancreatic cancer uh, realm or in mesothelioma. But all of our backgrounds and expertise cross over between all three of those areas. And it's very, um, you know, just, I guess, naturally has happened that there's different leads on the different types of the cancers and, and the types of interactions Interactions. And so you might take a, a stronger lead in one cancer area and, and really be more supportive in the other one or two areas. Mm. It's a very good question, but mm -hmm. I, it seems, seems to be working. <laughs> Anyone else want to answer on how you work together? Or is Owen going to give the answer for everybody uh, to demonstrate how it works? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah, no, no, we follow it. <laughs> uh, here, here. Um, I guess it also comes down to the original writing of what we wanted to do, because we even then got together and said, well, this is what we want to achieve. Who, who do we get? And you start looking for the right people to do the tasks that are needed to be done. So a couple of years before we were able to start work on it, we were already finding the right team members to come together so that it would work. So it does take an enormous amount of preparation to get that kind of commonality. It's, it doesn't just happen naturally. Mm. Yes. I mean, it, it does help that also within the project, the way how it was thought out, there are different technologies which are at a different stage of adoption. Um, so for example, the gels or, that Oren is making are already in a very advanced stage. So they might be getting into the clinical trials, whereas some of the vehicles are at an earlier stage. And this is actually a, a big advantage of the team because then we can learn about some obstacles, even regulatory obstacles from the technologies which are already more advanced so that we don't make the same mistakes. So this was also, I, I would say, one of the advantages of how the whole project was thought out and how the partners were chosen. We have a crowd watching online. I don't know exactly how many people there are, but I'd like to take a couple of questions from them. But please do let us know so we can get the microphones to you if you're uh, in the audience would like to ask something. But the first question from Claire McGlynn. Um, are there any lessons from the rapid development of treatments for COVID that you're drawing on to help accelerate the translation of your research? I, I can maybe say that yes. Uh, particularly in development of cancer vaccines. So mRNA vaccine, which was developed by Pfizer and Moderna, actually uses lipid codes, lipid nanoparticles, to carry mRNA, nucleic acid. So I think the whole field of the nanocarriers will dramatically benefit from this. First of all, because we, I think there will be adoption of this technology, easier adoption. There is also going to be a regulatory space. And I think it's also this psychological effect where you can see, OK, if there is a need, then you can really push the technology forward as well. So in that sense, it was extremely useful, I would say, also for our own project, just to see that we are working you know, in the, in the same, in the similar technologies and that we are working on the worthwhile system to explore. Anyone else want to pick up on, yeah? Can mention one thing? Uh, in, a, in a very focused way as well, it helped us understand the, the regulatory side a bit mm. better. So in some of the response that we, various numbers of us were involved in, in the university's response to COVID, uh, working on particular devices with clinicians, we had to very quickly get to understand the regulatory barriers and the changes that happened during that time to allow us to accelerate getting technologies to patients. And that meant we engaged even more rapidly and ahead of schedule with uh, regulatory experts because we were able, we had to do that during the response. And all of those learnings are, are being brought into this project. So that's sort of one practical example as well of, uh, from the regulatory side. It forced us to, to figure out that even earlier than we had anticipated. And assuming, because I mean, you'll have had a particular experience through COVID. I mean, we've heard a lot about some things obviously getting a lot more resource and others having to be um, slowed down. 
Did you find that you had lots more free time during COVID because there was less surgery, or did it make no real difference for you? A bit of free time, but uh, we still make, didn't make a lot of difference because, because um, although a lot of the work for much of surgical work was reduced, um, tumor still, cancer still went ahead. And brain cancer, which is what I deal with, um, we know that if we leave patients for more than a couple of weeks, they start deteriorating. And so we were often prioritized. We often did a lot of extra operating to just to, just to what, what operating there was, just to make sure we could 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 manage the patients we came through. But it was there was a bit more. There was a bit of downtime where we had some time to sort of stop, think, and um, uh, and uh, and plan for it. I think if you're looking forwards, when you sort of the next stage, obviously, is going to be look, thinking about the clinical trials. I do wonder whether, and there's a few people have wondered about this, whether one thing that COVID has done is has educated the public mm -hmm. better in research and yeah. clinical trials and might be more, it would be interesting to see whether they may, may be more um, amenable for us to have the discussions about using new treatments and new, and new, and new interventions because they've seen things happening very quickly within the COVID field um, uh, in terms of developing new treatments. I, I think that's uh, one of the things I would say mm. is that <clears throat> when the barrier comes down and the public is more engaged in the conversation, then perhaps the, the speed with which we can try to translate things in a, in a very safe way uh, can still happen because there are so many regulatory hurdles um, that, that I think um, addressing them in a, in a way that's safe but faster is, is mm. going to be to everyone's benefit. I won't ask about the sort of anti-jelly brain campaigns. And, you know, <laughs> um, so uh, another question from online, and again, please do put, put your hands up if, if, if uh, you have one, there's one over there. Um, uh, Grace Wakeman says, what happens to the structures that are used for transporting the drugs once they're delivered to the cancer? Is there a process to remove them or do they leave the body organically? <laughs> Who wants to pick that up? Okay, I can say something about the gels. Yeah. I mean, so, so the, the base um, polymer that we are utilizing for the gels is, is based on um, the, the ECM as well. So we're using hyaluronic acid, which is a, a, a native material to the body. And um, we, we have a dipeptide that's a, uh, attached to that, um, again, two native amino acids. Um, we use a little bit of other technology that we've tried, and, and we can sh um, be, be very clear, uh, don't have negative responses in any of the trials that we've done so far in animal trials. Um, we need to do still a, a full-scale um, toxicological trial, which we're in the process of, of, um, of trying to get funded. And, and I think that the reason that we chose, I don't think, I know the reason what we chose um, the backbone of hyaluronic acid is that at least in the brain, there is an upregulation of hyaluronidase production and that that leads to breakdown of the backbone of the, the hyaluronic acid. So um, in situ, the material would already start to degrade after it's, it's done what it needs to do. And, and then hopefully um, there would be no need for a subsequent removal. In some of the devices that we haven't really talked about tonight, um, those are uh, devices that can be um, <clears throat> plugged in into the brain, uh, deliver high doses of materials without solvent, so solventless um, delivery. Um, th those, those would, of course, need to be removed after treatment. Um, and in the cases of the, the MOF uh, type of, of chemistry, uh, those are also some things that we could deliver within the gels. And so those materials would kind of run their course and then be organically uh, um, kind of dealt with in the body so that we don't necessarily see a, a need to kind of remove them at a later date. Thank you. So there's a question over there. Yeah, I'm just interested to know if uh, if you guys research into prevention of these things coming. A lot of it's amazing work on curing cancers. Stop these things coming along in the first. Place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Start with that. Mm -hmm. So, so the answer to that is uh, there's not a lot of work going into this in this field, largely because certainly in brain cancers, the only factor we have ever found that makes um, uh, you more uh, prone to developing brain cancers is uh, there were some many years ago people used to use some vinyl chlorides for um, uh, in the leather tanning industry, and that seemed to have a, increased the rate of causing brain tumors. That's it. We have been unable to find any other cause of why people get them, and that's the difficulty. It's very hard then to stop 
to uh, prevent, uh, to, to, to think of preventative measures if we don't know what causes it. Um, we know that there's a few people with genetic problems where they are more prone to develop tumours all around the body, including the brain, but there's not a lot we can do to, apart from monitoring patients and picking them up early, we can do with those group of patients. The other side of it is what about early detection and detecting these tumours at a much earlier stage. So we did a very nice study where we took a load of our patients who had, uh, at the time when they first were told they had a brain tumour, and we interviewed them and asked them a bit about their pathway and what happened to them and what, where did they go to and how did they go and see, interact with things like their general practitioner and what sort of problems they had. And the, the clear message that came out of that was that the first initial symptoms that people get is they don't feel well, they don't feel right, and that's it. They just don't feel right. There is no specific, this is it. We were seeing whether there was something like, for example, headaches with something else that we might be able to say, okay, this is something we need to look into. But it wasn't that at all. It was, I just don't feel right. But I can't tell you why, why I don't feel right. Uh, so it's very difficult to, mm. to, 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 do, to, to, to do with. I, mean, I guess we could also say that from mesothelioma, there is a, a, mm. a pretty direct link towards asbestos exposure. <laughs> and, and that's something that clearly has been an issue here in this country and, and in several other places around the world where there was a large use of asbestos. And you can just look at the, the cases kind of lag from exposure. Mm. Um, and so at some point, you know, uh, there will be a, a steep decline as well, <laughs> at least here in the most immediate part of the UK. However, in the rest of the world, uh, you know, many of the things that we're learning now will still be very mm. applicable. So at least that can be said within mesothelioma. And I, I won't um, you know, discuss anything with respect to pancreatic cancer. That's not my area of expertise. Yeah. But I think really within the, the realm of pancreatic and brain, there's, there's, they happen. And, mm. and we need to deal with them in, mm. in society. Mm. And I mean, uh, we do understand a little bit about the pancreatic cancer, that there is a group of patients that might be a little bit more prone to some of the diseases. But it's, again, very difficult in terms of the symptoms to really guess that this is happening. So there is, there is a huge program within the University of Cambridge, and this is aimed at early detection of cancer. So there are lots of cancer biologists, but also physicists and engineers working to develop instruments that would have better contrast of the tissue earlier. So if you do the screening, if you do the CT or um, magnetic resonance images, that you can pick up some differences in the tissue earlier. And there is also one entire group working on even looking at the cells before they become cancerous. So there are efforts to really um, look into early detection. And, and one really important technology that will definitely help in this is the development of artificial intelligence, uh, deep learning algorithms as well, which are going to be able to analyze the images much faster and compare them to other images uh, that might be existing of the patients and enable faster and earlier diagnostics. So there are efforts. And we are, of course, communicating with our colleagues as well, because in early detection, they are also aiming to find biomarkers, some molecular signatures of the cancer as well, so that they can pick it up. And we are, of course, interested in these molecular signatures so that we can target them again. So there is a lot of crosstalk between all of these areas. Just, sorry, we going to uh, I was going to say, I'm not working on, on those particular areas, but in the early detection, one of the key things is the uh, trying to make them affordable. So mm. whatever those early detection sensors or mechanisms are, making sure they're going to be able to roll out. So I do, uh, and my team works on affordability of sensors. So looking at different formats that will be affordable and not just here but anywhere so while we have I haven't been um, working on specific ones uh, we're working with people who are looking at early detection and helping them understand affordability and getting things out to, mm. to patients or uh, to people to test in the home or the GP's office. Just before we move on to the next question, um, just throw in a, a, another thing that I've ha had an interest in, which is the challenges with early detection, making sure it's right. Mm. Mm. Because if you yes. diagnose things that people don't actually have, mm. um, you can, they're very treatable. Mm. 
you know, cancers that somebody doesn't actually have tend to go away after you do surgery or whatever else. But um, you haven't actually helped anybody, and you may have caused a lot of harm. So there's been a, a long-standing challenge about how you make sure you get it right <coughs> and not just early. Mm -hmm. So um, the next question uh, from online from uh, somebody who I, I presume from the name Teacher Science at GCSE. Um, <laughs> More, more back to fundamentals, what are some examples of the biological barriers that the body or tumour cells put up? What, what, what is it that stops the drugs getting through? Do I start with the brain? Mm. So there is a thing in the brain called the blood-brain barrier, and it's a barrier that stops substances uh, routinely going from the bloodstream into the brain itself. There's a few areas where, where it's deficient, which, which is needed for, for usual physiological purposes. And what happens there is that the, blood, the cells of the, of the blood vessels are, are different. Instead of having gaps between the cells where, uh, where um, uh, substances can move in and out, um, they are very tight to each other. So you cannot, get, you cannot open that up. You, there is no way of substances getting past it. They have to have certain transport systems to allow these, drugs, these substances to go backwards and forwards. And the aim of this is really to maintain a a steady state within the brain, so you don't have uh, abnormal sort of swings of um, uh, um, uh, uh, metabolites or things from the blood that may affect brain function. So, uh, and that's become very difficult in terms of getting most of the drugs across. You can get drugs that dissolve in uh, lipids, lipid, dissolve in fats, getting, get them across, but actually most of the drugs we often want to get across are, are other kinds of drugs. And, and the big drug molecules now that we're trying to use for some of the targeted therapies, that's very difficult to get, a, to get across um, the uh, um, blood-brain barrier. They really don't get across at all. And in fact, you see that with um, uh, things like, for example, breast cancer. So breast cancer, there have been some drugs. So Herceptin, for example, is, a, is a, one of these examples of these targeted therapies that has worked incredibly well uh, in stopping the cancer growing in the rest of the body. But because it doesn't get enough of it get into the brain, you find that where these patients have problems is they get tumours developing in the brain. Uh, and the tumours come back, it comes back, and it develops within the brain rather than the rest of the body. So... Uh, it's been a, it's been a, uh, that there is a real problem in terms of getting these drugs into the, into that. I guess in, in terms of the brain, that's one of the reasons that we are, are thinking that, you know, resective surgeries uh, as well as local delivery is, is really a, a nice opportunity. There are um, some types of tumors in the brain that are just not resectable. And, and one of the, the hopes is that because of the types of gels that we're producing, um, they could potentially also be directly injected into certain types of inoperable tumors uh, to at least slow the rate of expansion of the tumor or, or potentially even you know, have, have some sort of uh, decrease in, in size. Uh, but, but again, that's why we turned, at least in the brain, towards local delivery, because um, if, if you can't just deliver a, a, a drug systemically and have it cross the blood-brain barrier, the, the next attempt is, is really just put it where it needs to be. So, because we, the blood brain barrier I've heard of before, I haven't heard of a blood pancreas border or any of the others. So. Yeah, so, so another barrier before we even come to the tumors are, of course, our blood cells or cleaner cells that we have in our blood that can engulf the drug. And therefore, you actually get a lower concentration where it has to, uh, to, to go. And pancreatic cancer has also an additional barrier, and this is extracellular matrix. The, the, the whole matrix of the solid tumor is full of other non-cancerous cells, which have been shown to engulf some of the active molecules and protect the cancer cells from getting those drugs. And there are also lots of enzymes, proteins that can degrade those drugs. And also because of the density of the whole stromal tissue, there is a lower penetration of those drugs within. Or if they come in, they would usually diffuse alongside the barrier of the tumor, but they will not get into where they need to go. So, you know, there are mechanical, but there are also biochemical barriers that we have. And then, even if we manage to overcome all of these barriers, we still have the cell membrane. <laughs> so, cell is, every cell is protected by the membrane, um, and you have to find a way to get your drug into the cell where it's the most efficient. And so, this is, uh, these are all of the barriers that 
we need to work in. That said, it looks very complex, and it is very complex, but we do have some drugs that work, that have been formulated. Um, and for example, some liposomal formulations, uh, and liposomes are fatty acids, Na uh, based nanoparticles have been in use from 1990s, and they have improved the outcomes in some uh, cancer patients, in some forms of uh, cancer. So we are managing, despite having so many barriers, there are ways of overcoming them. And hopefully in the years that come, we will have a little bit more of a rational design. We will be cleverer uh, in, in the way we design our formulations so that we take all of the barriers into account. We're beginning to run out of time. If there are any urgent questions here in the hall, do let me know. Um, question from online. Um, what do you think some of the ways this technology could be used to tackle other problems are? For example, could the polymer structures be used to deliver catalysts in chemical reactions? Mm -hmm. Or perhaps, Oren, could they be used to allow you to run over them with a car? <laughs> uh, yes. yes. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> you know, the, the types of materials that we're working with in terms of the gels are very specific towards hyaluronic acid because of um, the ECM and, and a desire to bring them into the body uh, to, to help towards these hard to treat cancers. But the same concepts can be replicated across a wide range of both synthetic or other types of um, resourceable and natural polymers. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, we've, we've published on this um, over the last 10, 12 years, and quite recently in showing that we can take the materials that are uh, roughly the same modulus um, as, as that brain that you, you tried elegantly to cut through um, with, with a knife and spoon, uh, but we've we've essentially um, taken the same type of material and um, and used a different type of polymer backbone and a slightly different set of molecules as opposed to dipeptides, and we've been able to make a material that's also a jelly that can withstand a tremendous amount of compressive force, such as a car driving over it multiple times, or if you wanted to have a circus act, an elephant standing on it um, mm -hmm. with all of their force, and and they're. Comp completely compressible as a glass would, and, and then they uh, re-expand. And um, most, most gels tend to be brittle and just fall apart. And so we've learned a lot from the types of um, very fundamental uh, molecular level chemistries and how we can dissipate uh, a lot of the stresses placed on these materials. So they might be used you know, in catalysis, but they might also be used as um, a cartilage replacement, which is, uh, you know, something that many, many people are in uh, need of uh, that can be very readily delivered through a needle uh, directly to the site where it needs to be, um, uh, you know, doing what it needs to do in the body. And they might also be extremely useful in uh, terms of bioelectronics um, mm -hmm. or soft robotics. And so a lot of the uh, technology and fundamental understanding that we take from this project is um, very readily uh, translated laterally across um, many domains. That, that's also true for vehicles. Yeah. Some of these metal organic frameworks, because they have pores, they are very good for storage of different molecules, but also gases. Mm. So they can store oxygen and release it, or they can store hydrogen. So they might be considered to be used maybe in the cars one day to, to, to really contain the hydrogen. Um, some of the, the biopolymer materials, we actually designed them initially to work in catalysis, to mimic some of the natural catalysts we have in our body. These are enzymes. We wanted to design artificial uh, components that would mimic those enzymes. And this was the beginning of this nano vehicle design. So in this material sense and material development, there are also multiple uh, uh, kind of applications that you could find depending on the, the need that you, you might have as well. And if I could mention as well, just sort of um, just to look at the reverse of that, because that's where we came from the manufacturing side. A lot of the technologies that we were using for completely other reasons are actually informing this project. Mm. So being able to study 3D printing and then suddenly using the same level of experimental rigs and measures and controls to say what's happening to specific materials as they flow and as they go towards the patient. Uh, and similar, all the different flows of fluids that we've been studying over the years. Well, how do we bring that down and build something 
that will allow us to mimic what's going on in the body and what's mm. going to happen to the nanoparticles in the body. So we were sort of going the other way works really well too. Mm -hmm. So we are almost at the end, and I'd just like to ask one final question. I'll, I'll give each of you a chance um, to answer it. Um, what's next? If we bring you back here in five years, what, 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 what will change? Will the funding still be there? Will you still be saying how wonderful you all are? What will have changed in the research, but also in what can be delivered uh, to patients? Who would like to go first? Hmm. We will still say that, uh, you know, we work wonderfully together. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so in five years' time, hopefully there will be still funding in place, not uh, in this way. But what we are hoping from, from our side of a nano-vehicle development as well is to have data uh, which are done already in biological testing, a full toxicological profile, and hopefully few candidates that work very well for, for pancreatic cancers, but also other cancers. Uh, having those kind of formulations, I think this is, this is what we would like to tell you in five years. Okay. We'll keep track of this. We'll record the whole thing and check. <laughs> I, I'm sure you will. I mean, what, what I would love to see is in, in actually the next two to two and a half years, um, actually see uh, some of the gels as depots move into at least a, a clinical trial phase one uh, to, to show that um, there isn't any further damage than, than would normally be done. So it's really a safety um, trial, not an efficacy trial. And I would love to see within that five-year window, potentially even a, a phase two efficacy trial um, I mean, as, as um, Colin Watts has always uh, told me, uh, so many people can save mice. Uh, the real challenge is to make sure that we can translate that technology uh, towards saving people. And, and I'd love to see that, um, you know, a median survival, at least in, in glioblastoma, might move a little bit north of 14 mm -hmm. and a half months. And um, even if it moves to 15, 16, or 17 months, that's a, that's a, that's a significant um, movement, at least in that, in that cancer. Uh, I'd really like to see that, you know, I'm, I'm able to engage not just with Stephen, but with colleagues of his in a wide range of other types of, of very specific cancers, because I think that the GELS is a platform. Again, this is what we're funded to do, is to come up with platform technologies that can really, um, we learn and co by concentrating and focusing on one uh, specific aspect, can be um, replicated across to others. And I think that uh, w within five years, I, I, I do have a feeling that we'll be, we'll be having those discussions um, head on. and and very hopefully um, have some very good news, at least in terms of a phase one and potentially even phase two trial. Mm. In five years' time, you'll be out of a job, brain surgery all done. <laughs> well, it's, I think it's the opposite, actually, is that, is that, that, that a lot of these t technologies we're discussing with the, the gels, but also things we haven't discussed in terms of mm. other devices for de delivering drugs, will actually need more surgeons to put them in. Mm. Um, and will actually make my job more secure for a few years. <laughs> so I think I'm, I'm okay to, to retirement. But I, I agree, I think, I think the, the big thing now is gonna be taking this now from the experimental thing and from some animal model side of things into, into patients and actually starting to start the trials for patients uh, within the next, couple, next few years. Renan, you were the first one to get here. You get the final word. Oh, lovely. Thank you. <laughs> right. No pressure. I think, yeah, I absolutely 100% agree. The first and foremost thing that we should be aiming for is getting something that works to patients. And then the other thing that I would really like to say we've done, hopefully as well, not in five years, but, you know, in three years, is, is have something that people can read who are going through this again. We're not the only researchers doing it. We're not going to be the only researchers looking at this. And we're learning a lot through this multidisciplinary approach about what to tackle, when you should tackle it, going from a concept through to the patient and all the different risks. And what we learn, we need to put in a nice simple format so that anyone can do that and not have to learn the hard way. Fantastic. Thank you very much to, to all four of you. It's been truly amazing. And Nobody has said anything about it not being brain surgery. You know, it's been, no, I'm really delighted. So, 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 so just before we finish, please join me in thanking our four panelists and our apprentice surgeon.
brings us to the end of, of, of this event uh, at the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. Um, if you're interested in the other events we've run, many of them are on YouTube. Do have a look. We've had people like the Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization talking about vaccine nationalism, so hugely important issue. But we've also heard from the uh, executive producer of The Simpsons. We've heard from our former president about taboo language. We've had many, many other delights. You really should have a look at those. Um, next term, we also have lots of events ranging from um, uh, poetry looking at uh, sustainability and climate change. Uh, we have uh, Twitter's global head of public policy. We have the former Met Police Commissioner talking about facial recognition and why the police should do more of it. Um, whether you agree or not, do come along to some of our other, other events. Thank you very much for being with us tonight in person or wherever in the world you were online. Thanks a lot. Bye.